Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast. You are listening to episode 18, and wherever you are, at the gym, uh, in the car, in front of your computer, in your studio, uh, lying on your couch, wherever you are, thank you so much for tuning in. It's great to have you listening or watching again today, uh, and I know that you're going to get heaps of value out of today's show, which is called Everything But The Pieces, Part 1. And before I get into the details of exactly what we're talking about today, I do want to thank today's sponsor, who is the ABRSM. If your students are struggling with their oral skills, then the ABRSM has a solution that you're going to love. The ABRSM is an exam board that supports the teaching and learning of music in partnership with the Royal Schools of Music, and we're a feature of our podcast last weekend. The ABRSM offers a whole suite of digital resources to develop general musicianship skills and knowledge and help with exam preparation. One of their flagship resources is the award-winning oral trainer app for Apple devices, which offers an exciting way for students to practice their oral skills. And we all know how hard it is to get students to practice oral skills before exams. And we're gonna be talking about that a bit more today too. Through a series of interactive challenges, pupils can learn to identify and describe musical features and differences quickly and accurately with the oral trainer app. The light version is free to download and explore, so head over to abrsm.org slash Tim and you can check it all out. I'm really excited today to be working with one of my favourite Australian uh, teachers, none other than Sam Coates. And we're going to be talking about sight reading and oral tests. So it's very apt that today's episode is sponsored by the ABRSM and their oral trainer app. We've called this everything but the pieces because well, for the most part, I think most of us know how to teach the music in front of our students. That's kind of our bread and butter, isn't it? It's what we all do all the time, pretty much. But less so when it comes to sight reading and oral tests. These can kind of get a little bit left behind. Some of us need a few more tricks and tips up our sleeve. So today we're going to dive in and explore these two areas of exam preparation. Now, if you don't set students uh, exams, you don't have them sit exams, then uh, this is going to still be of great interest to you because obviously the ability for your students to sight read and the ability for them to use their ears effectively is all part of being an all-rounded musician. So regardless of whether the exams are a focus for you or not, um, I guarantee you're going to learn a lot from this episode. I did. You're going you're gonna to get to see me uh, on the spot having to kind of decipher some tunes and things that Sam's playing. Um, we, we have an absolutely great time. And for those of you who aren't aware, Sam Coates or Samantha Coates, uh, she's a, a fantastic presenter, teacher and author over here in Australia. Um, and she's created a series of books called Blitz Books. And she talks about them um, at the start of the interview of actually how she got into doing that. Um, but they are fantastic uh, books that uh, kids really seem to engage with uh, and we'll kind of explore a little bit about why that might be the case in this episode. But look, Sam has been, um, you know, she's one of Australia's most favourite kind of presenters um, and best known publishers and teachers. Um, she's been a performer, she's taught for 25 years and she's got extensive experience um, as an accompanist as well as a performer. And her aim is to make music more accessible to all instrumentalists through a holistic approach to the teaching of music theory, sight reading, oral and general knowledge. And in part one, we're going to be talking about sight reading and oral. Now, just before we, uh, we start the interview, I do want to put a, an apology up front because we did have a few issues with the sound uh, quality in this recording. So the first one so far that we've had a bit of trouble with. So look, I do apologize. It does get a bit, um, there's a bit of kind of you know, background noise, but look, we've tried to filter it out as much as possible. And um, I, I just guarantee, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't let this, this podcast go to waste because there's so many great little gems of information that sound gives so um, you know grab your pen and your paper or your computer whatever it is uh, and get ready cup of coffee um, depending on what time of the day you're listening glass of wine whatever it is uh, and stay tuned here is my interview with Sam Coates talking about sight reading and oral tests in everything but the pieces part one well Sam it is so good to have you here I've, I've wanted to have you on my podcast for quite a while now um, and welcome on this beautiful sunny day uh, down in Melbourne at least how's it up in Sydney 
It is indeed a sunny day in Sydney as well, and we have hot days forecast for the next five days. I know that the weather is going to be so good in Australia. We're just coming into summer, of course. I'm, I'm very sad for all you guys in England and uh, the States heading into winter, but we're coming into summer and it's great. Now, Sam, you've uh, been a request on my podcast. A number of teachers have wanted to hear from you. You're almost a brand name in Australian music uh, studios uh, for your Blitz series of books. So can you tell us just a little bit about your background and how you came to be doing what you're doing now? Well, uh, I am a classically trained pianist. I started piano when I was three. And uh, actually, when I was five, my mum took my piano lessons away from me because I refused to practice. And then about six months later, I went to the piano voluntarily. And she said, would you like piano lessons back? And I said, yes, please. And then I didn't look back. I went to um, the Conservatorium High School in Sydney, which is a specialist music in high school, even though it's a state school. And then stayed on there and did Bachelor of Music and majored in performance and started doing a lot of teaching, as you do when you are um, trying to make a living as a musician. And I found that I was teaching a lot of theory and I, I wasn't really happy with any of the other materials around and I started making all my own worksheets. And then after a few years of doing that, quite a few years, just the idea occurred to me one day I was standing in the kitchen I thought, I could write a book. I could just use all these worksheets that I'm doing, this sort of, you know, conversational approach that I'm using and write a book. And the title occurred to me straight away that it should be How to Pass Crossout Blitz um, Exams because I was inspired by a Terry Pratchett book that has a similar concept on the front cover. <laughs> right. And uh, it was um, – and then it all just went very quickly from there. I have a very supportive husband who then looked after my then two very young children. And then within three months, we published grades one, two, and three of Blitz books ourselves. We published them ourselves. So uh, it's been a fabulous adventure since then. Yeah. And yeah. And look, we're, and, uh, all the people in Australia, there's going to be a lot of people nodding their heads going, thank you, Sam, so much for the work that you've done because I know lots and lots of people that use your books for theory in particular um, and you know now you've kind of branched into a whole lot of other areas too which which is really really great and I just love your story you know you started by putting these things together for your own students uh, and then thought well hey I've got a book here let's get it out and get it get it to other people I think it's great so hey. let's talk about um, let's talk about two aspects uh, this is uh, part of a series on all those things that we have to do when we send a kid for an exam other than play the pieces. So we're going to focus today on oral studies uh, and sight reading. And these are kind of two things that, you know, teachers, uh, a lot of teachers would go, oh, do I really have to do this? Uh, and perhaps it doesn't form a regular part of their teaching. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But how important do you feel these two aspects are in the whole scheme of piano pedagogy? Well, I think you can't go past them in terms of importance. Because in learning music, of course, we all grow up and we learn specific pieces. And we spend months and months and sometimes years learning to play specific pieces. And with lots of practice, we can play those pieces. But then if you stop practicing those pieces, for example, if you've learned a Chopin Nocturne, you might study it for nine months and perfect it. And you might even play it for a whole year. Once you Stop playing that Chopin and Nocturne. If you don't touch the piano for a while, you don't touch that piece for a while, it doesn't stay in your fingers. And you can't play it anymore. You have to relearn it. So if you don't have a sight reading skill, you no longer have access to that piece that you learn. Mm. And if you don't have oral skills, if you can't play by ear or at least even make an attempt to try and play by ear, you don't have access to the music that you have no music for, that, that you may not have sheet music for. So by learning, by having good oral skills and learning a little bit to play by ear and also having good sight reading skills, you have access to all music for the rest of your life. You're not reliant on muscle memory and the hours and hours that go into learning just one or two particular pieces. Mm. So they're essential skills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and, and, I'm, and I'm with you there. I, although I, I, like a lot of teachers, will perhaps not do oral studies as much as I should with my students, but sight reading is top of my list. I, I do it with all my students in every lesson uh, and I make a real uh, 
thing about doing it. So, Sam, I'm going to make a little bit of an assumption here that I reckon a good 80%, if not more, teachers don't regularly cover sight reading and oral in their piano lessons, even though we all know that there's some great reasons why we should. So I'm wondering if you can give us some ideas of why you think that we don't do it as much as we should. Well, Tim, I absolutely agree with you that uh, 80% of people don't do it. Um, I think uh, there's probably an assumption that either you're born with disability or you're not born with disability to sight read, which isn't true. I think a lot of teachers just plain run out of time. There's a huge emphasis on repertoire. And, of course, students do want to play repertoire. They don't necessarily see the benefits of learning to sight read well and they don't understand that in the future that is going to help them learn more repertoire. Yeah, I think that's one of the big things actually, isn't it? It's such a long-distance proposition that that we know that they're going to be they're going to find this useful in the future, but right now they just want to play music, don't they? They do. And there's also some pressure from parents, I think, to learn to play particular pieces and the um, the way in which progress is perceived by a parent is that a child can play a piece and play a piece really well. But it takes quite a lot of months to learn that muscle memory. And sight reading is not at all about muscle memory. Sight reading is not about um, being able to play a piece really well. Once you've spent a few months on, on a piece, as we've discussed, there is no more reading that is taking place there. Now, the people who are really good sight readers in this world are only good for one reason. I've asked this a lot at my professional development workshops. I ask people to rate their sight reading from five being excellent right down to one being poor. Most people rate themselves a one or a two, which is quite sad, yeah. even though they will think it's quite important. But then uh, if you put the question to the people who give themselves a five, they're excellent sight readers, you say to them, why are you a good sight reader? The answer is always the same. They say, because I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. That's just what they do. They're usually the accompanist in church or something and they're constantly asked to play different hymns every week or they've been um, put in a situation where they're doing a lot of accompanying of instrumentalists or singers and they're constantly throwing new music. And when they're put in this situation, usually under pressure, again and again and again, you are forced to become a very good sight reader. But nobody is born a good sight reader. I have never heard anybody respond in, to the question, why are you a good sight reader? I've never heard anybody say, I don't know. I could just always do it. <laughs> I just yeah. don't know. You know, I never really learned how to read music and I, I put the music up and I can, I do can it. just play it. <laughs> Nobody says that. So sight reading is a skill that actually has to be practiced, just like playing repertoire has to be practiced. Mm. It is a separate skill that needs developing separately. And I think for a lot of parents, the perception is that because the music is in front of the child, uh, the parent thinks the child is reading the music. But in fact, they're not. And then when a new piece of music goes in front of the child, the parent is frustrated that the child can't read the new piece of music. Uh, but that's because the reading part hasn't been practiced. Only the playing part has been practiced. Mm. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, so I think we both agree that sight reading is important and we should probably all do it more than we do in our lessons. So let's talk about some resources and how you actually go about teaching sight reading and getting kids to do it regularly. Okay, well, I think the, the most important thing is to throw out the window the Every Good Boy Deserves Fruit and F-A-C-E. Yes, uh, I'm with you, and, I'm with you. <laughs> and there is no point in writing letter names on the music. That doesn't help because that's not how we read music. We read music as patterns. We don't see an F and think the word F and then play an F. Um, we don't, we, if we see F, G, A on the music, that, that is not going to help. What we want to see is that there's a note and then it steps up or it steps down or it skips up or it skips down. That's the only way to start read efficiently. Yeah, I am so, so with you, Sam. This is, this, is, this is the way I teach as well. It's like, yeah. I hope everyone's listening really carefully to this because you know what you're talking about. So let, let's keep diving because this is really good. Uh, well, I once set out to prove this point by devising a game where I changed the names of the notes and I got teachers um, in a workshop to um, I got teachers in a workshop to um, participate in this game where instead of the letters being uh, labelled A to G, uh, they were actually labelled H through to M. 
So H I J K L M N. No, all the way through to N. Um, and then we went through all the mnemonics. So instead of F A C E, it was um, I don't know something like J K L M or um, no J M N L. And no one could do it. Absolutely yeah. no one could do it. Uh, and it's, it proved the point that and to us, we understand EGBDF. We understand every good boy, every good boy is a brute or whatever people want to say. But it's gold to the kids. It means nothing to them. Yeah. So, yes, if we've got that thrown out the window. It's a matter of recognizing patterns. So, flashcards is fine for learning how to sight read, but not just to name the note. You want to play the note. It doesn't actually, you call the note. You can call it C, you can call it Do, you can call it elephant. It doesn't matter. What matters is, do you know what it sounds like? Can you sing it? And can you play it on an instrument? That is what matters. I'm with you. So, yep. the flashcard game for the students, great, but get them to play the note, not say the name of the note, because saying the name of the note is not an, an essential skill. It might help later on in, when they're playing in the band and the conductor says, I want you to pick it up from the E in bar two. Well, then it is helpful to know what note is called E. But uh, apart from that, if you're a really good sight reader, you're not really thinking letter names. Yeah. So how, how important do you think are single note flashcards versus reading a stream of notes that are relation have a relationship to each other? Well, single note, if I can go back to the reading analogy, I would say that single note flashcard is like learning sight words when we were little. We learned to just instantly recognize the and up. Those those sorts of words. But actually, then if you if you hold up a note to a student and they are counting up and trying to figure out what that note is based on a note they already know, that is perfectly good because that's like sounding out a word. That's like working it out. And what you're doing is you're working out the one note in relation to a note that you already know. But being able to read in stepwise and uh, scalewise motion and uh, in chord jumps or in skips and being able to recognize repeat notes at the beginning of all sight reading. So um, quite a few years ago, uh, my colleague at Australian Music Schools and I, uh, Michelle Matter, she runs Australian Music Schools, and it, it's um, very similar to Yamaha methodology in that the kids learn by ear. They learn to play by ear. They learn music the same way they learn language. So first they hear it, then they sing it, then they play it, then they read it, then they write. They still do reading and writing not delayed like in Suzuki. It's kind of right there, but it's on the end of the process. I was going to but say it sounded like Suzuki, but so that's the main kind of difference. It, it involves reading and writing right from the start, but it's not the first thing. It's not the first thing. So a lot of these kids at Australian Music Schools were very proficient at playing by ear, but we realised maybe we weren't actually really pushing sight reading as much as we should. So we developed the Sight Reading Society <laughs> and kids to join the Sight Reading Society and they, they had handbooks that they practiced from and they did a grade in each term and they would actually go to team. This is, um, both my kids uh, completed the entire Sight Reading Society and they ended up with a key ring like this that has 20 keys on it. It shows that they did 20 levels and the last level they got to open the treasure box uh-huh. and there was cool. some really good stuff. Can you hold that so, closer to the camera so we can see it? Yeah. So there's all these coloured keys. Oh, they're actual, are there actual keys? Yes, they're yeah, actual right. keys. So oh, they go for their grading and they were rewarded with actual keys on theory. Very cool. So then we sat down and thought, um, actually, this could be really good in a book. And so Michelle and I together wrote the site, the, the site reading, the blue book series of okay. site reading. Cool. So, so show, us, show us what they are and how they work. So that's book one and that covers preliminary to grade three and then books two and three go up to grade five. So there are levels in this book and there are – P stickers. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. So they've got to achieve certain things and then they actually get stickers for doing it because they can't really get real keys. But the, the idea of the Sight Reading society, society was to break down the elements of sight reading because to put a piece of music in front of a child and get them to sight read it, they need to know what they're seeing. You and I and most piano teachers, when we're about to sight read something, we are actually breaking things down in our and we're looking at rhythm, we're looking at key, we're deciphering patterns. Okay, I, I get that left hand's going to be easy, or the right hand's mainly based on a C major scale. We are actually taking all that in before we start sight reading it. And we have to teach our students what they're seeing on the page. We have to teach them to recognise what it is, break it down, and then be able to do it. So that's what the this sight reading books are all about. 
it teaches them patterns. There are five sections. The first section deals with rhythm. If you can't read a rhythm, you can't sight read. I, I, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that I, I talk to my students, I talk to them about it all the time. The top priority when they're sight reading is a sense of rhythm and pulse and to make sure that continues through it. Much better that they have a sense of the piece and it continues and it flows than they get every note right. I always say that. Absolutely. You can you can have a piece that rocks along, has a vibrant rhythm with a few wrong notes, nobody will care. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I often do this in my workshops so um, to emphasise that rhythm is more important than pitch. So I'll play you a little tune, Tim, and can you tell me what this is? Do you recognise that tune? Uh, not off the top uh, of my head. Okay. So now I'm going to play it again with the correct rhythm, but I might have a couple of wrong notes. Okay. You recognise that tune? The first Noel. The first Noel. That's right. That's exactly the same set of notes that I played, except the second time I just changed. So this is the first note. This is the first Noel. That's the notes from the first Noel. I can hear it Played now. with absolutely no rhythm at all. So you can recognise a piece of music that is completely devoid of pitch and only has rhythm. I mean, you probably played this with your students. You, when you clap a song, and see if they can recognise what song you're clapping yep. just from the rhythm. So we've often done this. Um, well, first, in fact, I'll do it this way. So what is this piece? to recognize but what if I um clap it okay so yeah it's really intel is it but yes when you play like that that's really there are eight C's to get through. Yeah, I've got it, got it. That's that's so, a great little exercise that, that any teacher can do with their students when it comes yeah. to trying to get students to realise the importance of rhythm and flow and pulse in sight reading. Yeah. For sure, that's a great one, Sam. Rhythm, yeah, rhythm's more important than pitch. If you go to any great performance and um, you see the pianist falter in rhythm, you, you can see it and you can hear it and you know instantly they've made a mistake. And because the, the flow is interrupted. But there are very few note perfect performances that if you have really fantastic rhythm, you can get through. So the first thing I think is to get students to prioritize rhythm over pitch. It's very hard. And so I say to my students, if you make, if you're sight reading something and you have made a mistake, you accidentally played a wrong note, okay, that's one mistake. If you stop to fix it, that's two mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Now you break the rhythm. It's much more important to keep going, and, and it's more musical. An, an examiner would much prefer to hear a fluent sight reading example that has quite a few wrong notes than to hear something that just stops and starts and is horrible and has no sense of rhythm. Yeah, I hope my students are listening to this too, so that they can hear someone else say exactly the same thing as I've always <laughs> said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, the, I mean, the main the, the main thing to get the point across with students, I think. Especially if they also play a, in, in a band. If they play in a band, they get this straight away. You say to them, you know, let's say the conductor is giving you a whole heap of band music and you're just trying to sight read through it. If you are sight reading your part and you know you've just played a wrong note, if you go back and fix it, is the rest of the band going to suddenly know to stop and stop with you and somehow know exactly which note you want to fix? And, and if everybody stops to fix their notes, is the band going to stay together? <laughs> no, the band is not going to stay together. And they do get that. I yeah. think most realise that, that in ensemble playing, that's not going to work. So duet playing is brilliant for mm -hmm. getting to prioritise rhythm over pitch. Yep. And I did a uh, podcast with uh, Paul Harris a little while ago who has the sight reading duets. I don't know if you've seen those. So uh, you, you play a lot, you sight read with your with your student. I, I, they're quite fun too. But that, that idea of, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going. I don't care what you do, yes. but I'm not yes. stopping. Um, that's right. And there's that other idea of kind of covering bars up, but I find that less effective than the student having that sense of I have to go on and I it, it doesn't feel right unless I do. That's what we're yes. trying to get across, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, mm. So there, 
they're listening. They've got to be listening to themselves, but listening more for rhythm than to pitch. Yeah. So the blip sight reading book, there's a huge breakdown of rhythm. There are sections entirely devoted to rhythm, and to be able to look at a rhythm and internalize the sound is the first step to 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 really know how it's played, to know how it's going to sound rhythmically helps so much. Mm. So there are pages where you just have to cut rhythms, but then there's another whole section where first you have to cut rhythm and then the melody underneath it is in that exact rhythm, but it has pitch added. Yep. So first cutting it and then you're playing it in that rhythm. So, And I generally find that when students read the rhythm correctly, they get a far higher percentage of correct notes. Mm. When the rhythm goes out the window, the, the whole thing starts to deteriorate mm. very badly. It's usually because they've stopped to find pitch notes. Right. So there's rhythm and there's pitch. But then there's also patterns. You have to learn how to recognize uh, patterns. Stepping notes, skipping notes, repeating notes is so important. And then moving on from there to bigger leaps. Recognizing intervals. Mm. Uh, recognizing positions of chords. So when we see chords, we don't try to read three notes individually. We just see a shape. That's and right. we, see, we see, you know, this shape. Or this shape, or this shape, when we start reading chords. So we go all over the place. Well, our hands are constantly changing shape according to the inversion of the chord that we're seeing. Yeah. And we've, and we've already kind of programmed that into our fingers as to how that yeah. shape feels to play and what, That's right. what our, yes. our hands is. See, yeah. Yeah. It's called one shape. It's always going to feel like that in this one three five. It's really important. It's harder for people who have very large hands, I find, because people with very big hands often don't want to use fingers one, three, five. On a seat, on a triad in reposition, yeah. They don't want to use fingers, well, the adults anyway, they want to use fingers one, two, and three. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what fingering you use as long as it's consistent. Yeah, I agree. I agree with the one, the one two. Even, even I have teenagers that like the one, two, three. And I figure, look, yeah. a lot of the time I'll play chords with the octave anyway, which means you have to have one, two, and three. That's true. Three notes, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm. great. No, that's great. So, so from from the ground up, your your approach to sight reading is let's let's get rhythm and get flow happening. Let's add some pitch, and then let's talk through the patterns that make up musical structure. That's right. And then later on, as the levels get higher and higher, it's a matter of gradually adding other important things to the score, like dynamics and articulation. And really, sight reading, good sight reading, is about on the spot editing. What can I play, and what can't I play? but I need to keep the flow. And actually dynamics and expression are probably more important even than pitch. Uh, I would say the notes come near the bottom in terms of importance. If you're accompanying somebody uh, and you've just been given the music and you have to sight read it, the really important things are to keep the flow rhythmically, to observe the dynamics so you're not accidentally drowning out the soloist, to watch out for repeat signs, to really look for expressive markings because they are all the things that make up the ensemble. If the pitch is fit out, oh well. Yeah. If you if the pitch is on and all the other things are out, it's a disaster. Mm. I do a lot of sight reading, and yeah, it's it's crucial to be able to simplify a lot of those horrid concerto arrangements and stuff like that, where you've got ten notes written at the same time, impossible to play. You just got to you've got to work out what's important, and yes. and as you say, get the flow and the feeling right. And, and try and keep up. <laughs> hang on for dear life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hang right. on for dear life. That's what it's like. And yeah. the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you sight read, the faster you get. It's just the same as any language. So I think a lot of teachers don't, um, well, they don't have time. I mean, the reality is that they don't have time in the lessons. And there, there is pressure from students that they want to play the pieces. And there's pressure from parents. They want their children to play the pieces. And it is hard to fit it in. So, um, I have to say the only resource I use for sight reading are the Blitz sight reading books because the students like using them. The key stickers, I, I've never seen anything be more appealing to a teenager than that key sticker in the book, <laughs> mainly because there's somewhere to stick the sticker. That's the thing. The page doesn't look finished until that key sticker is stuck on the page because there's a little shadow of the key sticker where it has to go. Okay. So, there's a sense of achievement. It's not not just a bunch of reward stickers at the end that you may or may not use. Quite crucial to the progress of the book. Great, great. So um, it, it's quite appealing to most students, but it can't really be started until um, they're doing roughly preliminary grade standards. You wouldn't you wouldn't start on 
your priority until you had a reasonable grasp of how to how to play what what the notes are. So okay. from that from those very beginning stages to there, you want to know how do you get there? And I think it's just all about churning through the repertoire and and recognizing rhythms along, and patterns along the way. Yeah. So it's uh, your books aren't a method a beginner method. It's a sight reading method that will come a year into or whatever it is into study. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly a year or two into piano playing, once you can you know you sort of. Um, and then it takes through. I mean, I've had students that I've inherited who are doing seventh grade piano, who I start on book one of sight reading because they might be seventh grade pianists, but they're preliminary grade sight readers. Yeah. Oh, I, they, I agree. It, in fact, yeah. that, that would be more, much more common than not. Yeah, it, it is very, very common. It's quite unusual to have somebody who um, who comes along who's a very advanced pianist who is also a very advanced sight reader, and more often than not, it's just that they haven't devoted any time yeah. to the skill. Sight reading. Yep. They need to to and they if you if you're preparing four pieces for your eighth grade exam, you spend a lot of time on the, the muscular requirements of playing four pieces. So you're not spending any time in reading skills. Yeah, that's right. All right, so let's move across to oral tests now. Uh, the you know everyone's going to groan as they watch or listen. Probably it's like oh do I have to do we have to do this. Um, and before we get to the exam side of things, you did an online survey recently, which I thought was really interesting, and you presented findings at the conference in Australia here. Um, what, what did that tell you about oral tests? Why did you do that? I was um, curious about, I was curious to find out whether people's oral is as bad as they think, <laughs> and I found out that it's not. Uh, humans are innately wired to recognise Sound, a huge range of sound, and to be able to discern pitch very accurately. It's a basic survival skill. And if we, if we can all, what I basically found is that people are all better than they think. So uh, there's just a plane going over here. <laughs> they get very loud for a moment. Are you near uh, Sydney Airport? Yes. Yes, it's one when you have to travel, but it's really annoying when, <laughs> when you're teaching. No, no, it's okay. I can hear you. Okay, still. Yeah, okay. So uh, the, the online oral survey was a selection of 10 sounds ranging from a snippet of a pop song through to a digital sound through to um, um, a very famous piece of classical music. Uh, over 1,800 people took this survey wow. and um, each sound was played at three different pitches. Pardon me. And the idea was to... See if you can discern the correct one. Now, this survey is still open. If you if you do oh, a search, because it was good fun. I remember doing it. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Yes, it's fun. It's actually still open. Okay. We're not collecting any findings. But if you just do a search on Blitz Book or Survey, okay. then it will come up. Great, and great. We'll try and find it and put a link in there too. Okay, fantastic. So um, the average, um, the overall average is around about seven and a half out of ten. That's wow. for the, the entire population. Uh, so apparently having 1,800 responses was equivalent to sampling a population of 10 million or more. Wow, of course, okay. Uh, and they weren't uh, all music, music musicians, were they? No, that was the point. No, I deliberately put it out there, so that's what I mean. So the average for the um, piano teachers and professional musicians who took the test was around about 7.8 out of 10. The average for the music students was about 8.1. Mm. But the average for non-musicians, the people who've never ever done the music, their average was seven point one. Fascinating. So, really uh, interesting. It was fascinating. Did people, you publish your findings online anywhere? Yes, there's I've blogged about it. There are two blogs on my at, at blitzbooks.com.au under the blog. Right. There are uh, two articles there about the about the findings. Okay, we'll then, make sure we find those and link up to them. Okay, okay, so let's talk about the vein of all exam teachers' experience, these oral tests. What are, your, what are your top tips here? Okay, well, uh, the, the thing about the oral tests as they are presented in exams is that it's not really a test of humans' innate oral skills. They're really memory tests. The way those particular tests have been set up, I might get in trouble for saying this, but um, I don't think they're a really good indication of how good a child's oral is because at Australian music schools, all we teach, we teach so much oral and we have so many kids come through with excellent, excellent pitch, fabulous relative pitch. Some of them develop perfect pitch as well. Not that that, uh, there's a whole other, we could do a whole other oh, talk yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. But the pitch is 
is not an advantage unless you have relative pitch as well. But these kids have fantastic oral skills, great relative pitch, but they don't necessarily fare well in those A and B oral tests because if you're played a little melody like this, and asked to clap that back, that's not really a test of how good you are at oral. That's just a memory test. And some of the melodies you're asked to clap back is a really bit random and they don't have patterns. Uh, and so they are really hard. So the first tip I would say is there has to be an acknowledgement that the oral tests, as they are currently presented for A and B, are actually quite challenging for everyone, including those who are really good at oral. Mm. I can say this about we should say this about other Amy B aren't the only exam board that have exam oral tests like this as well. It's pretty That's common. Right. Let's face it. Yes. So um, I think in, in some of the earlier grades, you're asked to sing the last note of the phrase. That's a really nice one because there's a sense of where is the tonic. Mm -hmm. That's great. But the ones that trip, the tests that really trip up the students are the ones where you have to sing something back that you've heard twice or clap something back you've heard twice. Um, it's very easy if the melody was something like this. I think pretty much anyone could sing that back. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the students that I have that are really beginners could sing that back after they heard it twice, even ones who don't like to sing. But the problem is that they're not, the melodies that are in those, um, the practice oral books are not um, in. They're not yeah. easy. Yeah. So you have to be comfortable with singing. Uh, to, how do you get a student comfortable with singing? You have to make them do it all the time. It has to become a normal part of the lesson. And my biggest tip would probably be pick little fragments of the pieces they are currently playing and just get them to sing that back. And start with just three notes at a, at a time. So if they are playing, um, so um, well, the problem is they often play in a register that's too high for them to sing. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's another one. Um, yeah. And I was going to ask you about boys as well. My, you know, a lot of my teenage boys, particularly whose voices are changing, it gets it can be pretty awkward uh, yeah. to sing, even if they want to. Sometimes that's right. Yeah, if, if so much of oral is, is wrapped up in self esteem, and in fact, that's what the survey that I did uh, really showed up. Because at the end of the oral test, at the end of the survey, you're asked to rate your own oral skills as uh, very good average or virtually non-existent. And then we looked at the results based on the self-ratings and we found that the people who rated their own oral skills as non-existent still actually did really well on the test, mm. which showed that they it's just a perception that they had no oral skills. Yeah. And it wasn't really an accurate assessment of their ability. That was just their self-esteem coming through, or lack of. Yeah. So, so you, you think we build esteem by making it uh, natural, making it regular, making it normal? Making it of lessons. Yes, if you've got a boy who doesn't like to sing or who claims he can't sing a note, you just say, sing your note. So, Tim, if you now pretend that you're a teenage boy that doesn't like to sing, could you just sing, just sing uh, any note? Uh, uh, <laughs> no. sing, sing it again, sing no. it again. Uh, 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 can you sing it again? Uh, 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 there you go. You just sang that note. Uh, you just sang it. Uh, yay. You sang it. Yeah, fantastic. Sing it again. Uh, Excellent. And now sing this. Uh, Here we go. And then I'd work from there. So okay. yes, you can sing anything, find what that is. Yeah. And as you can see, I don't have perfect pitch. I couldn't tell what that was as soon as you played it. But after a few goes, I found it. And it's kind of good, I think, if the student can see that the teacher is also, um, you know, finding their way around oral and just do it together. And, yes, do it a lot and make it make it normal. Yeah. It still comes down to time. It really is hard to make time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Going back to that little example too, you could perhaps, if the student gets comfortable with singing a few notes, maybe they could sing something and try and find it themselves perhaps. That could be another yeah. good ex exercise. Yeah, it's yeah. a really, really good exercise. I, Just I, yeah. good. I think the main uh, thing is though that you don't go, uh, you know, after three years of lessons, okay, we're doing a grade two exam and we open the oral book and here's the first question. And yes. it's all over the place and they've never done it before. Of course they're going to freak yes. out, aren't they? I would. In any, in any 
pedagogical approach with anything. It doesn't matter if, whether it's music or medicine or engineering. You have to move from the known to the unknown. There is no point in start jumping in with something that's unknown. You have to start with something they know. So getting kids to sing back fragments of their own pieces is essential. If they can't sing back something that's familiar to them, they won't be able to sing back something that's unfamiliar to them. Yeah. So you have to work up their confidence through being familiar with something. With mm. something. Right. And do you, do you use any apps or anything for helping with this personally? No, I just use lesson time. Okay. Uh, there are a few online things that I often encourage my students to go and search for themselves. I know there's a program called Aurelia, which uh, some people use, but I'm not exactly sure how accessible it is online. I don't think there's a free version. Yeah. I think it's, it's I think it's a paid one. There is uh, another one I know of called Oral Book, which uh, actually listens to your singing and can tell you how close you are to the right pitch, which is pretty good. Um, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes too uh, as another resource. Um, all right, so this question's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, how much time before an exam should teachers be giving to these things to make sure that they're going to be right? Yeah, that, I can see why you're saying that's a tongue-in-cheek question. Well, okay, I know so what let's the answer really about, is. <laughs> let's talk about, um, so the, the ideal response, you know, as, a, as an educator, or this is what you hear in a workshop, oh, you should be devoting a little bit of each lesson to this. You know, they should be doing it all the time. But in reality, that just doesn't work. Yep. So when you're preparing for an exam, really, you don't want the students to go in and completely stuff up their scales. You really don't. And you really don't want them to not be able to play their pieces. So in reality, if you've got a student preparing for an exam and you're really trying to hoping they can get the best possible result, well, obviously, you're going to concentrate on the things that the bulk of the things they're going to be assessed for. And now, the highest mark, the highest value. The highest mark, because in reality, if they don't do so well in their oral uh, or their sight reading, that's not the bulk of the exam. They're still going to pass. If they play their scales really beautifully and play their pieces really beautifully, if the oral and sight reading and general knowledge are not up to scratch, they are still probably going to get a B or a B plus. And some examiners I've known to even still give an A, even though those three areas were lacking. So I'm not sure about other exam boards. But what are we trying to achieve here, you know, as teachers? Here's the thing, that the general knowledge and the sight reading, the oral uh, ability are actually the more essential skills, the things that will take us into later life and equip us to be able to have access to music in the future. So... uh, for a lot of my students, what I tend to do is I, I chuck the whole exam idea out the window so that we have time to concentrate on sight reading and improvement of oral of value playing and composition and improvisation and really get into the nitty-gritty of what a piece is all about because it's so relaxing not having to um, work towards an exam. Mm. Now, then you've probably got heaps of teachers who are listening to this who, who have the bulk of students working towards exams and um, and Maybe it's because they enjoy doing that with their students or maybe it's because they're under pressure from the student or from the parents. So there's no question that we don't have this ideal world where we can just spend the whole lesson doing whatever we want. Mm. Uh, So it's really hard to answer. How do you you allocate an amount of time to a skill that really needs constant monitoring? There are some kids who happen to have a good ear and a good voice and you can wrap it up in a couple of weeks, you know, leading up to the exam. More, actually, I find that more of a, like a, a phew moment. Oh, this is oral. Great. <laughs> we don't have to spend any more time on that. I know what you mean. But if sight reading is not developed and if uh, then it's that that is, you can't, there's nobody who just happens to be good at sight reading. Yeah. In terms of oral, if the kids have a really, really good memory, that is going to slam them in a good stead. Um, but and to any instrumental teachers who are watching, please don't leave it to the accompanist to do. Oh, uh, yes. Please do it actually in lesson. Yes. Because as an accompanist, I'm sure there are so many times where the kids come along for their one and only rehearsal, and they say, "My teacher said you do oral with oh. me." <laughs> <laughs> I get this so much. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely true. Um, so yes, it would be great to allocate a certain percentage of every lesson to it. That's that's gonna be the most successful approach. But I think and I think it's possible to do that 
if you integrate it into the repertoire, there should be a holistic approach. So we shouldn't be putting the repertoire books away and saying, okay, now let's do oral. Those oral, it all should come from the repertoire. Clap this bit of that passage, you know, clap this, sing this back, um, play a chord. If, if, if their piece has a cadence at the end, which a lot of pieces do, <laughs> then play them this chord. Can you sing those notes from the top down? They've just heard that chord. They've played that chord. So work from the music they're familiar with. And rather than stopping and saying we're going to do oral, just treat it as this is all part of the music. This is just part of what you do. Don't take for granted what you're listening to and what you're playing. Make sure you're able to do it. Yeah. I think uh, that it's just really realistic uh, advice, Sam. I think it's, it's really good. Um, and... I would tend to agree. If you've only, if you've got maybe an hour with a student, you probably have flexibility to do this. You've got 45, you might have a little bit, but for most teachers on 30 minute lessons, there isn't that time. So I think you're right. The holistic approach, which Paul Harris talked about in um, episode, I think it was about nine, uh, his simultaneous learning approach to teaching is exactly that. It's like, we don't have time to pigeonhole everything and we shouldn't be doing that anyway. It's got to form part of the main focus of music, which is the pieces. So. I think you're right on the ball and I love those those examples and that advice you've given us. It's great. I hope that lots of people get uh, lots of uh, takeaways from this. Thanks, Tim. It's great. Uh, okay, so let's just wrap everything up. Um, any other resources that you've mentioned? You've got you've got some other books on your uh, music rest, which are, are they the other sight reading levels? Yes. Um Yes, just book two and book three. So there are three books in the um, Blitz Sight Reading series. It goes from um, preliminary basically up to grade five piano. After grade five piano, pretty much in any syllabus, there's not a sight reading book that you need to help you to learn sight reading. You just need to play music all the time. Yeah. Now, if you're a grade five pianist, you're not expected to sight read grade five repertoire. That's another misconception, usually from the parents. Most teachers do know that. But um, no one is expected to sit down and be able to sight read perfectly uh, the repertoire piece for their level. Yeah. Yeah. But if you go a few grades below, then that's kind of what you what you should be able to do. So by picking up music all the time and just sight reading it, that is the best way to prepare, especially for higher grades. Yeah. And Company, accompany people and play duets. Uh, so there's three, just three books in the sight reading series, and I do get asked, you know, what about where before? But it's really not necessary yeah. because um, then you just into the world of real music, just just sight reading all the mm-hmm. time. There's no actual all book. Uh, a long time ago, I did produce this for a workshop, which says how to blitz oral tests. Right. Uh, this was a limited edition book for those who are attending some workshops. But what I've done is I've put that into three separate blog posts which are now published on the Lips Books blog. Right. So right. Um, it's called All Skills uh, All Skills Part 1 and 2, All Skills and Exam, Part 1, 2 and 3. So it's just got a whole heap of t- tips on how to approach each one of the oral tests as set out in A and B. Yeah. Great, great. And you, I, I love your blog. I get your emails, so I encourage anyone who's listening to definitely sign up for those. You, you, you give away a lot of great resources uh, and links and things like that. So, yeah, it's, the blog is well worth looking at. Uh, and I should mention, too, just back on sight reading, in um, podcast episode four, one of the first ones we did was with Colin Thompson, uh, who was talking about his online sight reading program. Uh, and I like that the two of these things could dovetail quite well because the thing that his course does is actually provide music to read, which is one of the hardest things to provide lots of, particularly as you say, as you get to the higher levels. You don't want to keep asking parents to buy more books all the time. Um, so he has an online solution for that, which, which may be of interest to teachers. So I think that's podcast episode four. We'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes too in case that's of interest. Um, but I love your grassroots approach to, you know, starting at the bottom. And I love hearing that the key stickers are appealing to teenagers. I would never have guessed that. That's great. They are. They really are. And adults too. Because in the teenage world, you know, they don't get giving stickers anymore. Teachers at school don't give out stickers. 
Yeah. Uh, that will end pretty much at the end of primary school. So it's probably my 14-year-old girl students who are the most excited <laughs> about the key stickers. And uh, in book two, they're not just playing colours, they're all patterned. And in book three, they're all about sweets and lollies. So um, there are, uh, you know, marshmallow key stickers and um, mint ice cream key stickers, and they do like that. Right. So, I like it. It's really creative. I really, I really like how you've you've made your books. Uh, well, they're kind of they're fun, they're approachable, um, and they're appealing, which is great. They're not kind of this serious, boring kind of writing, which I, I like. It, it's it's very much your personality on paper, so as as it should be. Well, thanks for saying that, Tim. That's basically the whole good book philosophy: is for things to be presented in an informal way, in a conversational manner, because I find it easier to read and I know that students find it easier to read and also injecting the odd bit of humour because if a student has a bit of a giggle at something on a page, they're far more engaged with their learning. Yeah, most most teachers wouldn't consider humour and oral tests in the same sentence, so I'm glad you said that. (laughs) (laughs) Now... Uh, where can people find your books? Because you've got your blog, and that's great information. But I don't think you sell on your blog. So where do you where do you um, sell your books? Well, they're available in all good print music stores. Okay. And uh, so, and and a lot of those stores have uh, online stores as well. Okay, I was going to say for the international listeners, are they able to get these? At the moment, I don't have any international distribution. Okay. So overseas, overseas purchases have to pay the horribly horrendous postage cost that is the reality when you're sending things from Australia overseas. Okay, so they so can buy on an online store in Australia and yes. hopefully with our dollar going downwards, uh, that might be good, <laughs> <laughs> but you'll that have to ship, ship them over. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We're hoping things might be a little different in the, in the next few months, but um, at the moment it's published and distributed within Australia, so... The accessibility from overseas is limited because of the postage costs and the time. Um, but and, and but the sight reading books are relevant to any syllabus really in the world. The general knowledge book is relevant to any syllabus in the world. And um, the, there's also another book called Books for Beginners, which is a beginner theory book, which is uh, not aligned to any syllabus at all. It's just basic pitch and rhythm notation. What was that one called? That's called Blitz for Beginners, okay. and that's a theory book, which is lots of fun, has heaps of games, lots of humour. Right. And look, I can obviously recommend your theory, your actual theory books, which is how this all started, Blitz Your Theory for all the uh, AMEB theory exam grades. I've used them before. They're fabulous. So uh, highly recommend them. So is there anything we've missed before we sign off? I'm going to wrap it up, I think, Sam. It's been such a great conversation to have with you, and I know teachers, even if, even if they can't get hold of your books right now, I know that they're going to take away a lot from this uh, conversation. But is there anything else that you'd like to add or have we covered most things? Um, I think we've covered most things, but I think the only thing that I would like to add is that as music educators, we are, you know, we, it's so easy to get locked into an exam mentality, but what we're really doing is we're teaching music for life. We're giving the kids the gift of music for life. So to treat everything holistically and to, if we're going to talk about theory, talk about it in relation to the piece. If you're going to do all, talk about it in relation to the piece. Just get them more excited and more involved in the pieces that they're actually doing and draw every other aspect from there rather than teaching them as, all separate things like that's why theory seems so boring because it's, oh let's put away the, the repertoire books and let's take out the theory books. Why would we do that? <laughs> let's just all make it all about music because our ultimate goal is when you run into an ex student of yours in the street that you taught twenty years ago and they say to you, you know what, I still teach along the piano from time to time. I loved my lesson. That's what we want. Yep. Agreed. Here here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Well, thank thank you so much for your time, Sam. It's I know you've got a million and one things going on. You've got teenage children and they're doing exams and all this kind of stuff. So I really appreciate you spending this time with us today and sharing so many of your great ideas. It's great. It's been an absolute pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'll see, speak to you again soon. See you. Bye. Bye.